chairperson, um, Councilwoman Nadine Ramsey, uh, asked me to get the meeting started. She has uh, been unavoidably delayed, um, which uh, we all uh, share of most interest in the presentation today. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation concerning uh, the Mardi Gras uh, sanitation efforts and the catch basin update. And then we're going to have the stormwater management uh, ordinances uh, presentation from city planning uh, and uh, any other business that um, some of you uh, have for their committee, which I suspect won't be any more. We will start with the presentation. Uh, from Cynthia Van Leer, uh, the director of the Department of Sanitation, and Danny Galloway, the interim director of the Department of Public Works. Um, ladies. Good morning, council members. Good morning. Um, we're very happy to be here this morning, and certainly uh, Mardi Gras is over, and that's a great relief. We hope everyone had a great month. From the Department of Sanitation standpoint, we achieved our goal of completing the cleanup after 34 official Mardi Gras parades quickly, efficiently, safely, and thoroughly. Over the 10 days of parades, cleanups were complete, completed on eight of those days in approximately two hours or less after the end of the last parade. That's actually a record for us. Our goal is actually three hours. So we were very pleased that with changes to the logistics, coordination, and leadership of the supervisors from sanitation in each zone, we beat our own record. The actual time spent cleaning on any given day varies from four to 12 hours for each zone. And some days we have four zones just on one side of the river we may have three other zones if there's a parade on the West Bank. And this is dependent upon the number, location of parades, volume of debris, crowd size, routes, and of course the weather. Employees and contractors took special care not to disturb any of the gutter buddies or protective screens placed by BPW personnel to keep debris from entering storm drains. Very, very important to us that we do everything that we could and so there was training with our contractors with our employees to make sure we took care uh, to keep things out of the city storm grounds so from that st standpoint um, the whole key is advance plan we start the year after uh year before each Mardi Gras right after the last Mardi Gras we talk to all of our contractors, our employees, and we make adjustments. We send requests to, to the departments. We could not do this without a lot of help. We have a lot of things in logistics. When you start talking about that many people for that many hours, um, things that need to be put in place. And certainly from a contractual standpoint, all of those things are, are key and critical to the department. There are a number of things in terms of uh, equipment. We mentioned the partnership. Sanitation works with Parks and Parkways, North Sea, Public Works, and EMD. Couldn't do it without them. And of course, critical to the success is Sewage and Water Board, RTA, and the Downtown Development District. NLPD and OFD work to ensure the safety of our operations from start to finish. <coughs> And of course, we are based in property management's facility for the entire time. But key is just the sheer volume. There are 49 pieces of city equipment, 76 pieces of contracted equipment to make this happen. And that's just the equipment side. When we start talking about personnel, <clears throat> even though we put our estimated counts, this is what we plan for, for 2018, the column to the right actually has the total estimated number. And this year it was 917 people are involved in this process. Anywhere from on the ground, total laborers was maximum about 785. 
but certainly it's all the support personnel that are critical. So from that standpoint, on any given day, it might be 300 persons to almost 600 persons. The numbers, uh, if you will, for Black Men of Labor and Job One, they may schedule people so that their total number of workers is higher than a maximum of any given day of people who actually had an opportunity to work. So we contract with Formelli Services to assist as well as equipment, MDL, Richard's Disposal, and Metro Services. But I want to take a moment to talk about Job 1 TCA. This partnership is in its fifth year. We started with 50 persons in 2014. In 2018, the total is approximately 195 persons from Job 1 TCA and Strive and 50 persons from Black Men of Labor. We're even more pleased that we are able to hire some of those persons into full-time employment with the city with all benefits and all opportunities that comes with that process. We anticipate that we'll be able to increase the number of persons from these social service programs each year. <clears throat> we have ongoing relationships with these groups. We hire persons who have gone through the training of STRIVE, who have worked through Job One, as well as Black Men of Labor, and it has been a, a great partnership. For my graph, we collected approximately 1,199 tons of debris. That includes a ton that actually was recycled, but we added to our total because it was collected. Everything we collect keeps more and more from the storm drains. I've just put some before pictures for anyone who is staying around after a parade to know what some of the streets look like. And these are not necessarily our worst streets, but at least the pictures give locations uptown, downtown, and show an example of the variety of areas that we work through. I mentioned that crews are assigned to zones, but there's a process within each zone. We have a flusher truck. Normally, parade road goers will hear the horns of the trucks to be sure people know it's time to move as quickly as possible in some cases so that they don't get wet up. We do need to wet some of the debris so it doesn't blow and it makes it uh, easier to pick up. <clears throat> we use a lot of blowers. That has helped to increase our efficiency, speed up the cleanup time. But blowers can't get everything. So then we have rakers. After that, we have skid steers, front end loaders, and they push things into piles. And you have heavy, heavier front end loaders who actually pick up the debris and put it into dump trucks. After that, it's followed by street sweepers. Um, I love to watch them. Sometimes there are four that are making figure eights, if you will, um, because it's really necessary to make multiple passes for the street to really be clean. We include garbage trucks, of course, to pick up bags and empty public litter cans along the way. And so what you see now are some after pictures. We're, we're very proud of the level of clean we achieve. And we don't clean just the route. We also clean what we call the one blocks. So we try to get as much debris that's flowing down into the neighborhoods as possible. And then after Mardi Gras, we actually go back over the routes to clean again. But we have some challenges. And we are hoping that the public will continue to cooperate because many members of the public do help us, not only with clean up by bringing their own bags and taking their trash home or even bagging it and leaving it on the curb versus leaving loose litter on the neutral grounds and sidewalks or in the neighborhoods. But the tarps, the tents, the ladders, and, and sometimes straw do create a challenge. It is especially difficult when we're cleaning and we've cleaned an area and then someone removes a tarp or we try to be respectful and not blow on people's property. But when you're talking about that many pieces of equipment and that many crews, it's very difficult to clean around someone who has not moved their items. And sometimes people, uh, unfortunately, will 
clear things off after we've passed, which causes us to clean an area more than once. Plastic bags are a problem. We have been very encouraged by some of the crews and their efforts to recycle their boxes before load-in or after load-in at their locations of load-in. We're very encouraged about crews like Them Fatal, which for two years has not put plastic bags on their floats. They have provided their riders with other sacks to keep all of their items. The plastic bags are a problem, not only for the cleanup, they do blow if there's any wind, and certainly they do uh, contribute to things that may end up in storm drains. We also have a challenge when we're working with crews for debris before and parade's official start and after a parade's official end. So we included our times, and even with those times, those include sometimes an hour to clean up beyond the official end of a parade. So we're going to continue to work with everyone to try to make this process as efficient as possible. And I've included another picture of a very, very clean street after the cruise have passed. There are some additional opportunities. We were very pleased this year that YLCNR initiated a pilot recycling project. And it was planned for the parades of Correct and Toast. Due to weather, it occurred only on that first weekend with the parade of Correct. The citizens were very enthusiastic. They had about 200 volunteers to sign up. The city helped and facilitated as much as possible in their process. We helped to bring in Republic Services, who was absolutely excellent. They provided a garbage truck and agreed to take the recyclables of paper and uh, plastics, rather, and small metals, regardless of contamination. Although, YLC and R did a great job of uh, handing out two different bags and making sure the citizens who received the bags understood the goal of the project and uh, utilized the bags appropriately. So at the end of the day, the public reported only a 1% contamination, which is absolutely outstanding for any public space recycling. There were some challenges, of course, with weather and rain. Um, ARC did express that their costs were much higher than anticipated because of the volume of cleaning and sorting and manpower that was needed. But at the end of the day, the good news is that they collected approximately a ton of beads. Um, including the recyclables uh, that was estimated at 10,000 aluminum cans. I just want to mention, we always love the citizens who come out after parades. There are persons who recycle after every parade that are just from the community, and we encourage them to do that as long as they are in front of our cleanup crews uh, in the process. This is not the first pilot recycling. <coughs> Excuse me. Roberta Graf uh, did recycling in 2012 to 2014, and we uh, supported that effort as well. It is really key that the public help us in this process. So we are working with Aqua Grid and New Orleans and YLC, and we have a meeting plan to talk about other ways to do this, maybe bringing in more of the businesses, persons along the route to maybe adopt a can, a location where persons can bring the beads, especially after parades for recycling by art. It's just really, really important. The more that we recycle, the less that we are paying in tipping fees, the faster the cleanup process goes. And certainly, art has a great program, and there are others who take beads and recycle them. On March the 10th, the Department of Sanitation has designated our next monthly recycling drop-off as Mardi Gras Day. So in addition to, in addition to the uh, plastics and paper and metals and electronics and glass, up to four tires that people can bring to us, batteries, as well as light bulbs, we hope that people will bring their Mardi Gras beads that have been sitting in the corner 
since Mardi Gras Day to us so that they can be reused. And we'll continue to work with DPW on finding ways to find sustainable solutions to protect storm drains, to reduce and eliminate unwanted items flowing to the lake. And finally, I just want to say thank you to the council, to other city departments, our contractors, the public, and especially to the employees of the Department of Sanitation. People see us after parades, but what they don't realize is that our crews, no matter if we finish at one or two or three, or four in the morning, they actually start again at six. We have to empty trucks and restock supplies just to be ready for the day's parades. So it's a great experience. It's one we look forward to every year. Again, thank you to everyone. If there are any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. With uh, Commissioner Councilman Brissett, I'm gonna let the public speakers uh, speak first. I have three cards that appear to. Well, first of all, are you presenting on this topic or? Um, on you my catch-basin catch cleaning update, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe these public statements are more catch basins. So maybe we'll let you go first. Do you have anything on the uh, Um, 
um, from my standpoint on street sweeping, I can address that. We do not have the manpower or equipment to sweep every street in the city. We have a schedule where we street sweep major thoroughfares, uh, and but it is not to the level of detail or scheduling to be able to do every street in the city to match the program. But this is one of the things we were talking about. Sanitation and DPW will be looking at what can we do. We understand it was very successful with using the gutter buddies. We do have screens in the French borders. Uh, that's been a program with DPW. But that location has street sweepers on all the streets on a more frequent schedule. Uh, but this is something we'll be looking at and working towards and we'll provide the estimate of what the cost would be to both departments to install the street screens, maintain the screens, and have the street sweeping capabilities needed to maintain that type of infrastructure. I mean, it would make more sense. And look, I appreciate the work of the men and women of uh, DPW and sanitation that you would put a, you would you would plan a pilot program throughout the different council districts of the city, uh, you know, from uptown to Cal to New Orleans, East Virginia, Terry Lakeland. And you know, it's an issue about fairness and, you know, the pilot program, I'm sure it's working well in downtown, French Quarter area. And I'm sure that the sanitation contract for the French Quarter is more intense than every other regular garbage contract. Uh, throughout the city's neighborhoods as it relates to uh, the intensity of the debris in the French Quarter. But, uh, you know, I think it comes down to an issue of fairness and I don't understand why these pilot programs can't be planned throughout, uh, throughout the city. That's not great. Well, well, I actually want to take a second look at the cards and the hands being waved at me. I think I will let the public speak. I mean, the uh, public who uh, submitted cards speak. Uh, and I'm going to do it in the order in which they were given to me. Uh, first is Brett Davis. Are you speak, speaking on this issue, Mr. Davis? Uh, someone ought to give you a, You're not Mr. Davis. Is Brett Davis here? No, that's the That's you. Would you like to speak to the microphone? Yes, please. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Brett Davis. I'm a native New Orleans. And I'm the person that organized the recycling pilot program that Cynthia spoke to in the presentation. And I'd just like to make a couple of comments today. One being about the success of that program despite the weather, uh, the attention that we got from the public uh, concerning this issue, which seems to grow uh, even worse every year. I just saw that Cynthia in her presentation noted that there were 1,000 199 tons of waste collected off the street. Uh, that is uh, a big difference from last year and the year before and the year before. Um, so this issue is getting a little bit out of control. And while we do have a great volunteer effort going between ARC and YLC currently, this year it's at such a scale that it, it really can't uh, solve the problem that is facing us and, and match the scale of the problem that's facing us. We really need some support from the city, um, whether that's through a public-private partnership or the city adopting some of these pilot program initiatives that we're taking on. Um, and I just want to say that you know the media coverage that we got around this was exceptional. The public response was exceptional. From the crews that we partnered with, they said that uh, from within the crew and towards the crew, they could not have had a better response. So I think the time is really ripe to focus on this issue, um, seeing as it, you know, we've got uh, an incredible amount of money from taxpayers that's going towards cleaning up uh, the post parade and then cleaning up throughout the year with the storm water drinkings, you know, what we got out of that. Um, and that leads me to my second point, which is cleaning up Mardi Gras is not just a post parade effort. Uh, there are certain things that need to be focused on that are based around how we permit uh, these parades and what they pay for permits. I think that number, I don't know if anyone is familiar with what it is, but 
it's uh, a shockingly low number uh, of money that these parades pay to the city. Um, none of that goes towards Department of Sanitation. None of that goes into assisting the work that Cynthia does, and she does amazing work, but I understand that her budgets are stretched quite thin, so I think the topic of revisiting, you know, what exactly are we allowing these crews to do, and can they not do a little bit more in terms of helping us out in the future? And I have some ideas for that, which I'd love to get in front of the city council at some point, so I'm hoping to work with y'all on that. Aaron uh, Biles, and, and, and while I don't think we have a time problem, if someone keep a clock coming up. Yes, sir. Hi. Good day. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Biles. I live at 3114 State Street Drive. And I've been here for 17 years now, so I'm not born and raised. I hope you won't hold that against me. Uh, some folks on Facebook did. Uh, because I started a petition uh, that you might have seen uh, to, as it's called, titled, Ban Beads of Mardi Gras. That was really just to get some, uh, some attention. But the reality of it is, the 46 tons, I believe it was, that was pulled out of our catch basins in a five-block area on the St. Charles Parade route before Mardi Gras certainly got my attention. I'm assuming it got other folks' attention as well. Uh, and it said to me, we need to do something about this issue. I'm glad to see that the gutter buddies uh, deployed uh, on the route, that's fantastic. But we all know what happened in July and August and how incredibly vulnerable our city is to surface flooding. The idea that our big celebration is playing a role in making our city more vulnerable uh, was incredibly troubling. Uh, and so the petition was well received by a lot of people. Uh, over 15,000 signatures have been uh, enlisted in support of the idea of making Mardi Gras less to uh, toxic and less trashy. I think the uh, 46 tons of beef pulled from the catch basin. The catch basin's got people's attention, but it just brought up the other issue that a lot of these um, beads actually have toxic materials in them. So uh, Howard Milkey, uh, who is a, a toxicologist, has looked at this, did an independent analysis of beads. They found lead, they found arsenic, they found a lot of things you do not want in the city's water supply. Uh, in the garbage, uh, any, really anywhere, close to people. And if, uh, I believe, I remember correctly, uh, Mr. Mil or Professor Milkey's uh, research showed elevated lead levels in the areas that were on parade routes. So it is something that we should be considering. Uh, I know that the city doesn't buy the beads, uh, but the city certainly can play an active role in uh, helping to lead New Orleans' uh, premier celebration to be less trashy, to be less toxic. Uh, the idea that we pull 1,200 tons, uh, collect 1,200 tons of debris and garbage post Katrina, I'm sorry, post, a few orders might be more than that, uh, post Mardi Gras, that's a lot of garbage. And it's great to get the pilot program cut that number by one ton uh, in just one, days of, one day of work, but what if the city was actually prioritizing that? And what if the city was really truly leaning uh, on the idea of making Mardi Gras less uh, trashy? Uh, I think that'd be fantastic. Uh, and I would hope that you guys would be open to that idea and using your voice to help out. So just really quickly, just so you know, it's not me uh, alone that's concerned about that. And I think uh, my co-author of the petition is gonna be speaking next. But I wanna just pull out a few of the comments that people made on the petition itself. So this is just 18 pages of the people who live in Louisiana who wrote personal comments when they signed the petition uh, about what they would like to see the city do for Mardi Gras. Uh, this is Hope Brewstar, lives on Lakeshore Drive. Uh, it is vastly unnecessary to pollute our streets and clog our drains with chemically poisonous, non biodegradable plastic beads. When did toxic trash become a requirement for having Mardi Gras fun? I'm all for Mardi Gras, but not if it means we can't find a biodegradable alternative. It's time. Year after year, bead manufacturers are producing thousands of tons of new beads, the major majority of which will just end up in landfills. Time to stop contributing heaps of solid poison to the landfills and start partying responsibly. And those are two words you probably don't want to hear together that often. But I think it's certainly uh, parting responsibly something you need to be thinking about. Uh, and one more com uh, comment, Ivy Doe from Le Mans Street. Mardi Gras beads are just a decoration, but truly no one in the state of Louisiana truly wants them. Only the tourists keep them, yet Louisiana is a state that has to suffer with the consequences. Throughout the years, New Orleans has had a very tough time dealing with the weather and the infrastructure problems in general. We can fix it one problem at a time, starting with the unnecessary. 
So there's page after page, thoughtful comments. And, 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 and just an interesting yeah, time. I'm certainly. Uh, I just wrap up really quickly. Uh, we all know that Mardi Gras is you know, incredibly important to our city, and I wouldn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. But I think if the city could help us lead in the direction of reducing those those deeds that have uh, very little long utility, but have a very long uh, lifespan in our uh, waste stream, that would be fantastic. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have, you're gonna have to help me with this last name, Shelby? Ian Shelby. Shelby, okay. Gonna say it again when you get the mic. Sure. My name is Ian Shelby. I'm also a lifelong resident of New Orleans. Um, I co-authored petition with Aaron, and he pretty much covered all the points that I would have liked to have made as well. So I'm not going to add a lot to it, other than to say that I do think it's worth pointing out that among those toxic uh, substances that are in our bees, that there is a strong correlation with those toxic substances and crime, um, another concern for our city lead poisoning and uh, crime. And the second point that I wanted to make is that not only the lack of longevity, but families everywhere, we don't want these bees. People, they, they come home and they immediately go, you know, straight to a recycling center or to the trash. They, when I was a kid, the bees were, the, you know, if there's a bee on the street, you grab it, you put it around your neck. Now, nobody even wants to touch the bees. They're a complete waste of no interest to anyone. So that is all I wanted to add to what Aaron had already said. Okay. Thank you. Gail, Calvet. Uh, thank you. And first I want to say... Um, I, I know you both support Annapolis. Yes. But go ahead. So my support <laughs> is that I have a compliment for the director of sanitation and the fabulous job that they do during Mardi Gras, and we appreciate that. And so I um, chair the infrastructure committee for several organizations in the French Quarter, and so I'll be speaking specifically about the French Quarter. So first, to correct the record, there are currently no screens on any of the catch basins in the French Quarter. I think the pilot program that the director um, alluded to was a previous program that was funded by the Department of Public Works. It was a grant that um, the Department of Public Works received. We worked on that project to make recommendations on what catch basins would be used in the pilot program. Um, we recommended that fixed screens be put in the first seven blocks on Bourbon Street, and uh, the Department of Public Works wanted to try retractable. Um, screens as well, we explained that those would not work because the cans and the cups and the debris and the other things would get caught in the mechanism closing back and forth, but they agreed to do half our way, half their recommended way. And within a week, they were the open and closed were failing because of what we had already told them. So we learned from that that the fixed screens on Bourbon Street are the only thing that worked. In addition to that, we have businesses that clean out those catch basins, the front of those catch basins, every day. We have, in addition to that, um, people who sweep the catch basins every day as part of the contract for sanitation contracts in the French Quarter. When the uh, Bourbon Street improvements took place, all of those screens were removed, all of the new piping came in, and so now we have catch basins with no protection. We um, inquired before Mardi Gras, and Danny, I sent you emails to it before December. I think you were um, out of pocket, and so I forwarded them to the next person, and I got no response to this question. We are concerned that Mardi Gras is upon us and we have no protection for our catch basins on Bourbon Street. We have foot deep garbage of beads and plastic cups and debris that are going to go down our brand new drains. And so when are the screens going to be replaced on Bourbon Street? FTBA followed in person up with that question um, at the on location um, meetings in the French Quarter, and they were told 
that is on the punch list. They have still not been replaced. All of that debris went right down our brand new catch basins and into our brand new drains over the um, holiday. We know that protections were put in place on St. Charles Avenue, but somehow we got um, missed in our um, uh, program. So in addition to having the screens replaced, we have French Quarter Fest coming up. What we would like to ask is that um, those screens be put back in place on Bourbon Street as fixed screens uh, in time for French Quarter Festival so we don't encounter the same problem. In addition to that, when they are installed, we would like to have those catch basins vacuumed out. So we are back at square one rather than having trash in, and bees in those catch basins right now. One of the reasons we were able to get the environmental grant is something the city could look at is because all of that stuff goes into Lake Posh Train. And so there are grants out there um, available um, in the environmental community for screens on the catch basins. You could do that not only in the French Quarter, but you could do it in other areas of the city. Now, just to be clear, that pilot program was not funded by city uh, dollars. It was funded by a grant that the um, environmental folks uh, gave us. So my question is one, can we have, and I guess that's directed to Dan, can we have the screens put back in place on Bourbon Street by French Quarter Fest? Let, let, let me say, um, first of all, you pretty much use up your time. Uh, we will go through all the public comments and we will uh, direct a few questions at that time to the uh, presenters. Great, thank you. And as always, we're open and um, happy to work with the Department of Public Works and Sanitation on any information and um, uh, manpower that we can provide. Just, just, can I just say one more thing? Quickly, the yes. city has a great program. It's called Adopt a Catch Basin program, and it's called Catch Basin uh, Gov. And people have hopped on to that like there's no tomorrow. Those people are cleaning out those catch basins. You could put screens on those catch basins, or you could allow the people who are adopting them to put temporary screens on them until the city has the funding to do it. It's a very simple thing to do. Um, and so I'd like to talk further with them about that. They'll be available out, but we will probably redirect some questions to them when we get all the public comments in. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Katie Simon. Question for Danny. Um, can you guys clean up the catch basins yet on the uptown parade route since Mardi Gras, or have you not cleaned them up? I'm sorry, but you have to direct the questions. State your question, I'm sorry, and get real. That's my question. Have the catch basins been cleaned up on the uptown route since this Mardi Gras? Okay. Well, you're not going to get an answer now. You, you make statements, and then we may well go back to the discussion. And, and council members, I would like to know that Danny does have the catch basins. Uh, uh, McConnell and if I didn't do you justice, tell me the name. Hi, yes, Caitlin, I'm Connell. Um, I'm actually with the Common um, Environmental Advisory Committee for City Council. Um, so I just wanted to kind of have an update. Um, we had a meeting on Friday, and Brett covered a lot of the issues that we um, talked about. Um, and just wanted to um, to talk more about the trash and the waste, and that um, something that we've recommended is to increase recycling and composting throughout the city and for events, and that would really help with a great uh, education for um, citizens that would help with the amount of trash and waste that occurs at the daily to keep the U.S. cleaned up. Um, and I just want to. Um, Say that I volunteered for the um, the recycling um, program that happened at Barrett Parade, and it was incredible. The people were incredibly receptive. The city was ready to to have to have increased access to recycling. Um, events contact YLC throughout the year to have recycling at, happen at their events. Um, so we're just really ready for this to happen, and uh, I encourage you to to work. Closely with the EAC, um, 
and and you, uh, one of the recommendations that we made. Um, maybe I will let Danny give her report about the full weekend. We may have, then have some public comments, but you may answer some of these questions with your comments. Go ahead. Thank you, Council Members, for having me here today. Um, we've got a request that I'm getting on the catch basin cleaning and repair program. So I'm going to go back to the slide that um, I had on the meeting that we had on August 17th when we were funded for this program and the goal of the program was to paint 15,000 catch basins. As you know, we own 68,000 catch basins citywide and we had to identify how we were going to work through this program. So this is, you know, um, the slide that we presented then and we said we would prioritize it by the inundated flood areas, all open 311 requests, um, emergency routes and major thoroughfares and around students' parks um, and playgrounds. Um, and we would actually not include any of the catch basins where we had full plan construction in coming up in the next six months at the time, and the ones that we had already gone through the one year long environmental review process on the Hurricane Isaac drain point repairs. Um, we also committed to increasing and committing that the people of the city would do this work, and we partnered with our higher NOLA office to make sure that happened. And just so that everybody's clear on the process that we followed for the catch basin program, we've outlined the workflow um, on the end right there. So the catch basin assessment and inspection program um, commenced, I believe, on September 26th. Um, we actually assessed 33,008 catch basins citywide. Um, contrary to popular opinion, not every catch basin in the city of New Orleans needed to be cleaned, and we did not want to waste our funds cleaning ones that did not need to be cleaned. So if we assessed it and it did not need cleaning, we moved on. So um, the number of the catch basins assessed that did not need to be cleaned was um, 9654. And we have this data, we you know, work with your staff and the Office of the Inspector General among other stakeholders to give them access to this information so that they could follow this on, on our online portal. So the Catch Basin Cleaning Program, since the start of 2017, the city collectively has cleaned 23,354 catch basins in New Orleans. We asked our partners at the DOTD uh, post um, the August with flooding to please come help clean the state routes, um, and they gladly obliged. Um, we had our city crews cleaning the patch basins through the whole of last year, and we also had our contractor um, start in September. So the emergency patch basin cleaning program that started in September cleaned 15,259 patch basins. The city cleaned 6,548 6, patch basins, and the state cleaned 1,547 patch basins. And we've outlined this all for you um, on this slide for a total of 23,354 patch basins. Um, we stuck to our goal of cleaning the 15,000 cash basins in 120 days. We completed this on schedule and on budget. Um, we also ordered a back truck that you authorized for us in October of 2017. It actually arrived on the North Shore last week and it needs to um, be outfitted with specialized stuff which is happening right now. We have a training schedule for our staff um, with that new back truck on, on actually tomorrow. Um, this will be the latest addition in our fleet. We have five, we will have five operational uh, back trucks currently and this will make it our uh, six, but we have one that is was purchased in 2004 which doesn't work very well so we might have to consider retiring that. Um, so we had, during the program, anywhere from 16 to 22 black trucks. We worked seven days a week across all neighborhoods in New Orleans. The local higher DB goals on this program were met and exceeded in the catch basin program. I want to thank Kevin Hagen with our high NOLA. We did a, a lot of open houses um, with our contractors and our subcontractors. We reiterated to them the importance of hiring the people of the city to do the work. And while the goal was 35%, we achieved 60%. 
um, of the workforce on this catch basin cleaning program that resides in New Orleans, maximizing the economic impact of this city. So the bad news was the amount of debris um, that we did find in the catch basins. We found a lot of tires, a lot of construction debris, um, a lot of plastic. We uh, removed over 7.2 million pounds of debris from the catch basins. And that's just the 15,000 that was done by the contractor. And the reason we know that number, I've got this question a number of times, is that when we go to the landfill, every single truck has to have a manifest and they weigh the amount of debris and they're sorted by the types of debris. So that's the reason that we have this number. So, you know, we, we have um, the information to go along with that. Um, since we, um, we, we learned our lessons, uh, we decided to do something different for this year's Mardi Gras. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the catch basins we had cleaned stayed clean uh, during the Mardi Gras process. So we purchased 200 garter buddies and we put them along the parade routes um, on Napoleon, St. Charles, Orleans, and Magazine. Um, we, we filled the garter buddies with our own staff and as you know, the area between the circle and Poitras has a unique French drain system in the city, and we had to use a different methodology for coming up to protect those drains that had been cleaned. That was the area that we had uh, pulled out the 93 pounds of um, Mardi Gras beads uh, during the cleaning process. So we actually um, got this fine mesh and put a one by four and we installed it into the, into the ground and we checked on it, you know, after each parade and it really did work very well in keeping the beads out of the French drain system, which is a lot more difficult to clean and cannot really be cleaned with uh, the equipment that we currently have. Again, the program was citywide, uh, but we, you know, as prioritized by you all and prioritized by the administration, we focused on the inundated neighborhoods of the city. <coughs> on, on this particular program, um, considering the high profile nature of this program, we had a back end system. When we launched um, this portal, we did training for all your staff and uh, for the Office of the Inspector General who worked with us to, to fine tune this program. Um, you can check every single catch basin. There's a before and after photograph. It tells you when the work was done, who assessed it, um, if it moved to the repair bucket, what the estimate was, how much the invoice was. All the information is available on this portal per each site-specific um, cleaning, assessment, and repair that was done. And um, you know, your staff have used it you know, to its full extent. We get lots of questions about it. Um, and we work with them if there's issues that come up uh, within it. But each, every single site that we have cleaned has uh, a before and after photograph, as well as who cleaned it, what subcontractor or contractor. Nobody does this alone, and the residents of this new one, uh, of the city really stepped up. We did um, training uh, in five different neighborhoods, along with neighborhood engagement. We held sessions all through the month of October. Every Saturday, we took our own cleaning staff, we showed them how we clean the inside of the catch basins and how they can help keep the outside of the catch basins clean. We cleaned, uh, we had over 40 residents uh, from each neighborhood come out and it was kind of a train the trainer kind of initiative and they really took charge and we really appreciate um, their help on this program. We also, um, you know, continue to get requests from neighborhood associations to come help them on a Saturday morning, and we continue to do that. And they can work through their neighborhood engagement liaison in order to make that happen. Um, so the Neighborhood Adopted Catch Basin app uh, was developed by the IT department. Um, we had a, a small beta testing program, and then we launched it um, end of last year. Um, you can actually go online, you can adopt a catch basin, you can name it, and you can commit to keeping the outside of it clean. We currently have 618 people who have adopted the catch basin program, um, and it continues to get some popularity, and we thank 
everybody for participating, and we encourage others to do the same. As I said, this effort, I think, involved almost every single um, department around the city um, that definitely offered the Department of Public Works a lot of help. Um, it goes without saying that our maintenance crews have been doing this work for several years, and they do it well. So um, they are on the front line of this and keeping this program going. While the clean contract may have ended, our folks continue to do this work every day, and people can report that to 311, and we use that as our work order system um, to initiate the work. Um, the residents of this city have been outstanding. Um, I walked around during Mardi Gras and I saw a lot of people with their own bags recycling the beads and you know, making sure the area in front of the catch basins were clear. So it has become, you know, definitely um, the awareness has been raised. Uh, thank you to the council for getting the funding, the DOTD, um, the LDEQ um, really helped us on this program. There was um, so many questions that they came to the table with and helped us answer and got us the help and the expertise needed. So I really thank them for their help. Office of Neighborhood Engagement, the Office of Workforce Development, Cynthia and her whole team who helped me every day. Uh, park and Park Race, we had a lot of tree roots growing over catch basins. Um, you know, Anne and her team definitely helped us uh, figure a way out of that. Um, of course, 311 and ITI, the Office of the Inspector General, uh, the communications office and neighborhood engagement who constantly get the word out and our contract with CDS and our engineers. So once the catch basin cleaning program, once we identify a catch basin that needs more than a cleaning, it moves to the repair program. So we are now in the midst of the repair program um, and we have repaired 2,400 catch, uh, 2,416 catch basins since the start of this program. I believe this program started in October. Um, so we're making good progress. Um, the initial part of the program was the easy fixes, the, the lids and repairing around the frames. Um, but we are continuing to do the, the harder work um, that needs to be done now. So while the numbers may be a little lower, it's not because we're doing less work, it's because we're doing more complicated work that takes a longer time. Additionally, um, the Hurricane Isaac Great Point Repairs um, contract, which was in um, environmental review, um, that was 109 repairs that were funded by CDBG funding. Um, that work has already started. Uh, we have uh, 12 completed, 40 active. These are the more complicated Great Point Repairs, so they do take a little bit of time. Um, you have a list here of um, some of the ones that have been um, completed today. And this program is um, about 50% complete and it had a 12 month window. Um, so in terms of the catch basin repair program, uh, we work five days a week across all the flood inundated areas. Uh, we started this program the same way we started the other program, the ones that got clean and got identified and moved to repair. You know, we obviously we put those by neighborhood, got them estimated, got that work approved, and then started the work. So we're pretty much all over the city right now. Um, we bid those items as type A, type B, type C. Obviously the easier ones are the type A, which is a big replacement. The harder ones are the type Cs, which require a lot more additional work and a lot more excavation and take a lot more time. But we're doing repairs of all types on this program. Uh, we also had some funding for um, some drainage point repairs, and that program is also underway. These are some of the um, some of the program that um, would have been in the system for a long time. The more complicated drain point repair uh, program. This slide also talks about the lid replacement program that we did at the end of the year. These projects just mainly needed the lid and the flat flat. Um, frame adjustment, we did 73 of those at the end of last year. Um, if I can answer a couple of questions on the Bourbon Street, you would like me to respond? I do have an update on, on that. Do you have any questions about the scattered? Yes. 
Um, so the Bourbon Street project, as you all know, ended in, in January. Um, we did um, do a post Mardi Gras cleanup. Uh, we cleaned those catch basins on the Friday after Mardi Gras. Um, and so all the catch basins on Bourbon Street have been cleaned post Mardi Gras. We did not get the screens installed in time. We started that yesterday. We have um, six installed in the 100 block and the rest of will be installed by the end of the week if the weather holds out. So in terms of the debris that was in the catch basins, you know, um, post Mardi Gras, it didn't go very far because we got to it the very next day. Homeland Security, the fire department, um, and DPW and sanitation all were out there the very next day and we got those catch basins cleaned. Um, to answer the other questions, we have cleaned most of the catch basins on the parade routes. The only area that we have not cleaned is the area where we currently have a DPW project, um, our St. Charles Avenue project, which is between Calliope and Felicity. Um, obviously, the contract is still there. I want to make sure that when we clean it, there's no more construction um, happening on the street. So besides um, that area, all the other parade routes have been cleaned. Uh, on average, how long does it take to, uh, to clean the catch basin? Council member, it really depends. We've seen some get cleaned in as quick as 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and I have been there when some have taken like two to three hours. It really depends on what is in the catch basin uh, for us to clean it. But there's some that have been compacted so thoroughly that we have spent a couple of hours cleaning it. And do you... Uh, do you prioritize certain catch bases over others? Um, in this program, we prioritize them by the inundated area, which was the charge, and um, clear those in that way in the 311 system for a long time. But on a, on a daily basis, we go in a council district each and every day. What we've been doing to make it a little bit more efficient is in the past, we just kind of went to each council district without kind of looking at what was in the system for that council district more holistically. We are working currently, we're about 70% of the way through on um, a GIS focused um, system where now we take the 311 calls, we download it um, onto GIS and we can see by council district where the most amount of calls are for that council district. Once it's reported. Yeah, so we download the 311 data once it's reported, and then we'll look to see, you know, for example, if there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, calls from um, Gentilly, for example, instead of running all over District D, we will focus on going and tapping all those calls in Gentilly that is in 311, and we will also make sure that if we are in that area and other catch bases need to be cleaned, that we do that. And what's your, what's your step? So District A is on Mondays, District B on Tuesdays, and District C on Wednesdays. That's been the schedule. And so I'm, I'm asking this because I don't, I don't want constituents, especially um, folks in Gentilly and East Algiers, to think uh, or to have to wait for their catch bases to be clean in other sections of the city. Right, no, I mean, each council member, each council district gets a day of catch basin cleaning. I think what we were doing in the past is we were cleaning two catch basins on this side of District D and running to the other side of District D. We might, what we're doing now is we have, we built a, a, a portal, a, a GIS-based portal, basically, because we have all the technology in-house now to look at the 311 calls, where they're coming from, and then we break it down by council district. So if I have a a lot of calls, you know, from one part of council district A, I'm going to go to that part of council district A first. And on council district B days, I'm going to go to that part second. What is the uh, three one one uh, calls in the queue for catch basin as it stands today? I don't know that number. Um, I don't know that number right now. Can we, can we can get it for you. The status of where are you on that backlog? Uh, we have cleared the backlog as it pertains to catch basin cleaning. But we we had a huge spike in our numbers, obviously, when we did the emergency catch basin program. You know, we had a, a, 
a lot of people use a 311 system, which is the system we were using to generate our work orders you know, in September, October, and November, so the calls spiked up quite a bit, but we, we managed to clear those if they were um, reported, I believe, before the end of the year, because we collected that data every Friday and created our, our cleaning schedule based on that. And I know among the catch basins, there's uh, this whole issue of drainage point repairs. Can you tell us where you're going on those? Right. Um, so the slide um, that we have um, is the 101 drainage point repairs um, that were done with the Hurricane Isaac funding. So we're about 50% um, completed on those. That Those are more complicated, obviously. We go in, you know, that's, we figure that out because there's a big hole in front of the catch basin or 10 feet away from the catch basin. So we have to use CCTV. In some cases, we have to do a design. Uh, before we can get that work done. But that work has already started and we've made quite a dent in, in that even though it says only 12 repairs are fully completed, the completed part means the paving and everything has been done and the cones and the barricades have been removed. But 40 of them, the pipe part has been fixed and we're made, waiting on the paving part to be completed. Thank you. Back to, you said it may take 30, 45 minutes to clean the catch basin. But once it's reported to 311 and DPW, when when will y'all get to it? How many days, months? If I call in today, I don't have that statistic, but I will get it for you because we're working on this portal. With you know, we're we're working through some of those logistical issues right now. But I will I will get that number for you. Got it. You got a generic time frame: three weeks, a month. I would say a month. First of all, for some of the general suggestions, let me say that uh, we're not going to make decisions sitting here about new programs and what we ought to do, but I, but I think we've listened to the suggestions, and I do think that uh, the council will go back and, and we'll make sure that um, the council is aware of those suggestions and, and make a decision about what uh, focuses we might have over the next couple of months in terms of, of what we ought to start because we're really talking about a long-term project and I'm sure the administration has heard what's, what's being said about some of the suggestions of what we ought to do and, and hopefully uh, in the near future you will hear us announce uh, new initiatives uh, hopefully adopting some of the suggestions you made today. Um, I, I, I guess in, in terms of, um, I've been uh, quizzed, aside from my, my constituents, by the press, because they've looked at your uh, data sheet on the catch base that you're cleaning, and um, truth is, in District E, there are far fewer than some of the other districts. Uh, for the record, tell me why is that true? So District E has a lot of ditches. Um, you know, we call them now green infrastructure, but they're really uh, ditches that have been there. Um, and District E also has, it's, it's a newer, in New Orleans East especially, they have a, a different draining system. It drains, um, you know, to the retention ponds and things like that. So. Um, in District D, primarily, you have a lot more what we call, you know, um, ditches rather than the subsurface infrastructure, which is uh, drain lines, drain pipes, and catch basins. And the same is true for some areas um, in Gentilly, and um, we have some in Lakeview as well. It's about 30% of District D has um, ditches instead of catch basins. Now, now you said. Your work orders were generated by 311 calls, which I guess at some level makes sense. Um, but, but the truth is, we have a problem, a particular problem in the lower nine, because first of all, many of those drains are designed in such a way that they're in the street, or at least along the curb. And if we're missing a cover, a car drops into that hole and is seriously damaged. Uh, and, and I know we had problems with people stealing covers. I know we 
got some composite covers to replace them. But it appears to still have uh, places in the lower nine where there is no cover on the street surface that covers the drain. Have you looked at that? Or are you working on that? Council Member, we did a lot of cash trace and cleaning under the square brand in the lower nine, and we identified all the areas that we did not have covers, and we, we have replaced them and will replace more. I can tell you as early as last week, I had a lady call me from the lower nine and tell me that there was a white truck with the Mississippi license plate stealing cash trace and covers. I did let the 15th Street police know that, and they now are investigating it. But at the end of the day, this is an ongoing problem for us because people do steal those covers, they're getting chopped up, and they, you know, um, it ends up being trapped. And we've looked at, especially in some areas of the city, of just doing composite um, covers just so that there's no street value to it. In fact, I thought we were doing that already. We, we did, that works if it's just a square cover. It doesn't work. The composite covers do not work as well if it's a rollover cover. So um, we, you know, talked with our engineers a few months ago, and we're doing a lot of work right now under our capital program in the lower ninth ward, and we are seriously looking at, even though the bid says it's metal covers, we're seriously looking at, um, you know, making them all composite covers. Um. Incidentally, uh, I happened to be walking down Parker's the other day and noticed someone rebuilding a, a catch basin. And uh, they were doing the brickwork, and, and I actually walked up and looked into the catch basin. And what it appeared to me is that probably the day before, when they hadn't finished, they still had enough over cement, which they apparently dumped in the catch basin. Now, they hadn't finished. And may well be that when they finish, they're going to clean it out. Uh, I actually intend to go back and get make it back. They did today. They did today. But, but I was concerned about that because the work is rebuilding brickwork, but he's dumping so the, cement in the catch basin. So the bottom of the catch basin is cement, the walls are brick in some areas. I understand that, but I can look in and see where it's fresh cement that is just being dumped. Not spread, but just dumped, which I assume happened because it was time to knock off and he had unused cement and he had to do something with it. But, but, but I, what I'm saying to you is as I stood over the work and looked in at the bottom of the catch basin, which I understand is cement, there was fresh, but probably the old cement that was just in a pile there at the bottom. Each catch basin before we sign off on the work is inspected. So we make sure that there is no concrete other than the concrete that's supposed to be there at the bottom. We have a before and after photograph of any catch basin that has been repaired. So we will ensure, I'll walk over there and ensure that that doesn't happen. But I know for a fact that my inspectors will make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I assume so, and I hope so. And I plan to go back myself, but I didn't. So uh, it, it's right there on the corner of uh, St. Charles and Partners. You're rebuilding one. Um, what's the, what's the, uh, 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 apparently in this position of somebody, the DBW crew, uh, in house or contract? That's part of the presentation I think is going to be given by Zach and Tyler. We have made considerable headway since last August on citing people. Um, especially construction debris, which is a huge problem in the city um, in terms of, especially in the downtown area and in other areas. I have a photograph that came in today um, of folks that, you know, wash out their concrete, wash out the stuff on the public right of way, but um, Jared Munster has has been um, given the authority now to hire some stormwater inspectors and we have worked together to, to make sure that, you know, we raise the bar and people understand that they're not going to be able to do that and they will get fined. And I believe that presentation is coming up right after me. Um, one other thing that was mentioned by you, Ms. Savannah. Uh, you take four tires 
from each sense. How does that work? And where do you take the four times? So at our monthly drop off, citizens can bring up the four tires. We accept the tires, we document where the tires came from. We can bring the tires to Cope, which is the only approved tire processor in the New Orleans area at this time. Citizens, though, who are eligible for collection, garbage collection by the city, can put up to four tires on their second collection next to their garbage carts. And our contractors, Empire, Metro, and Richards, will pick up those four tires from eligible properties on the second collection. And by second collection, what do you mean by that? So for Richards and Metro areas, there are two garbage collections during the week. It is that second collection that citizens can put out their four tires. Do they have to just put out the four tires, or do you have to call someone and say you're putting out? I would tell you that the best would be to call 311 and say I will be putting four tires out um, as bulky ways, only because the tires are not collected with the regular garbage. It is a different truck to pick up those tires. And, and that is the system, because I know because I put out four tires. Uh, it seems to me would work better that, and I understand it's a different truck, but that if you were allowed citizens just to put the four tires on the street, truck goes by and sees that there are tires and the truck can deliver the message. But uh, I think the process. easier we make it for the citizens, the, the more likely it is to happen. And, um, and, and incidentally, the tires I put out weren't my tires. They were tires collected from the neighborhood that, that I couldn't figure out anything else to do with. But, but, but let's talk about that process. Uh, if, if everyone knew they could just put the four tires there, we might have citizens who would go out and just get tires in the neighborhood and put it in front of their houses. But if they have to do it, call someone, get an appointment, it, it makes it go hard. They don't need to schedule an appointment. It really is sort of, a, if you will, a backup plan to have called to say at this address there will be four tires on the day of the second collection because each company has a supervisor along the route. So generally those are the people who will come after the garbage truck or before if they're in an area and pick up the tires. Citizens don't have to call. It's just a extra assurance. The truck operators should be calling to the supervisors to say I just passed four tires because they know they can't put it in the garbage truck. It's just a backup plan. Right. Now, I'm sorry, in the French quarters, because they have uh, more daily collections, Wednesday is the day that persons in the French quarters and the DDD can put four tires uh, in front of their residences if they're eligible for collection by the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, completes this, and again, to, to the citizens who made recommendations to us, uh, they have not gone on deaf ears. Uh, and then, Councilman Brissett. Thank you, Councilman Brissett. Just to mention to DPW, uh, with all this street work that's going on, uh, I think it's important for DPW and Sewage Reporter Board to make sure that you all's crews does not exacerbate the problem, um, the issues with clogged test basins. As many of it, uh, we have the capital improvement plan going on, and many, I've, I've seen uh, crews just dump stuff, uh, you know, into the uh, test basins uh, from their days of work. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a big issue, and as long as the capital improvement program is uh, going on for years ahead, and, you know, y'all need to make sure that y'all properly monitoring uh, and disciplining, you know, individuals that are contributing to the problem. Because this is just not somebody that's building a house, uh, you know, uh, whether, whichever street project they're working on, you can find, you know, 10, 15 people out at a site uh, at one time. 
So, uh, you know, we know construction debris builds up, but there needs to be a proper way not to uh, put that into the storm drain and to, uh, to haul it out. Because it is such an important topic, voice towers is a major problem in the city of New Orleans. And certainly, um, there have been a number of high profile situations, fires. I just want to thank the council for passing the ordinance that we've been working on for a while that will allow the sanitation rangers and safety and permits to bring uh, persons in to hearings with associated fines. These are primarily tire shops who may not be registered with LDEQ or who may not be disposing or storing the tires properly. It's really important that everyone follows the process. And we will be doing stricter enforcement. We have been working with LDEQ. Two arrests have been made of persons who are illegally disposing of tires in your district. I was happy about that. I was going to mention that. And we want to make sure that the courts, and we encourage everyone to help us um, make sure that these persons who have been illegally disposing of tires on the public rights of way and in many cases on other persons' private properties uh, are brought to the brought to justice. It is a major problem. We're working with mosquito termite and rodent control. The Department of Sanitation collected over 35,000 tires last year. It strains our resources. Those are reasons why we are limited in other things like street sweeping and everything else. If we had everyone following the rules, doing what they need to do, we have more resources to do other things. So, we are taking this very seriously, along with NOPD, LDEQ. We intend to do even more sweeps, making sure that all the tire shops in our city and all the citizens, so thank you for allowing me to, to make this request of everyone, follow the rules. We do want to make resources available for the average citizen who changes his own tires dispose of those tires properly, but for everyone else, especially a business who is collecting fees and not following that process, we want them to know that we are coming. Thank you. Uh, I would also thank Ed and Cynthia. You should uh, give presentation again as it relates to my graph schedule and uh, schedule of fees. You should probably look at for these parade crews that to take a whole lot of money and you know men and women are you know cleaning up afterwards uh don't go to the last time the fee structure was looked at as relates to uh support uh, for your other <coughs> for your department that's another bus i just wanted to respond to your um request we have included in every one of our construction contracts uh, on the capital program that the contract is paying the cash basis is when the city of New Orleans will accept the project. So we definitely will ensure now that we have additional inspectors um, that they will be doing the, doing the duration of the project and that at the end of the project they will clean all the cash basins within the boundary of the project before we get to walk away and before we accept the project. Let me, let me just say it's not just in your area. I think the city of New Orleans has suffered from inadequate uh, inspections before accepting construction projects over the years. Uh, we, we find too many things that are wrong that should have been discovered on uh, uh, final inspection before we ever paid the contractors. The particular pro uh, catch basin that I was concerned about was clearly a rebuilding effort. And I was concerned that they finished the brickwork, they put the cover on it. The rebuilding effort was perfect. But unless you look down in it, you wouldn't see whether or not they had cleaned uh, what I think they put in that catch basin uh, during the construction process. And, and obviously, we need to be careful about that. I'm sure you are, and you will continue to be. But um, uh, and it's not just your department. Uh, it is it is every construction job we have in this city 
that there's a serious question about the adequacy of our inspection before we accept the jobs at the end. We need to improve that. Uh, thank you very much. We will now have the stormwater management uh, ordinances presentation. Uh, if you're ready to go, let's. Well, let's wait a moment. You may proceed. Good morning, council members. Good morning, council members. My name is Tyler Antrust. I'm with the city's office of resilience and sustainability. I'm joined here with my colleagues, Nick Smith, chief building official of the Department of State Permits. Uh, we just wanted to give you a brief presentation on the three ordinance system in the council uh, at the next meeting um, that are uh, connected to the city stormwater code. Um, currently, there are regulations that um, were adopted as, as a part of the CCO project in 2015. Uh, with regards to the detention and filtration of stormwater in private developments. Um, these were the first stormwater management requirements for private development in the city of New Orleans. Um, the city of New Orleans, uh, when we adopted those requirements, was one of the last communities in the United States to adopt those types of regulations. In fact, communities like Jefferson Parish, St. Bernard Parish, St. Hanley Parish, um, and most other communities, even in the state of Louisiana, previous to the city of New Orleans, had um, some level of stormwater management requirements for the development where the city of New Orleans had none. Um, those requirements were really driven by goals within the resilience chapter of the master plan, which required the city to modify the zoning and subdivision regulations to encourage on-site storage and filtration of stormwater, um, and was also driven by requirements in the city's MS4 stormwater discharge permit uh, through EPA and the Clean Water Act. Um, when we really started looking at um, how we could improve the stormwater management program, um, we recognized within the first couple of years there were a number, number of stumbling. Uh, blocks in the way, that were uh, a very slow review process, there were some, some issues in getting those projects reviewed in a timely and efficient manner. So we wanted to start looking at how other cities do it, because if other cities all over the country do this efficiently, there must be a better way. Um, what we found was that we are really the only city in the country who has decided to place our stormwater management requirements within the zoning ordinance. Most other cities, um, and here we have a table of, of a number of our peer cities, particularly in the south, 
uh, but also large and aspirational cities in other places. Uh, but most of them either locate their stormwater requirements in the city code or the building code. And almost always, those requirements are administered by either um, their equivalent of the Department of Safety and Permits or the Department of Public Works. Um, when we're looking at how we could potentially change this program, there's a, a process that, that we need to follow in order to do this, and we've already initiated this on in most ways. Um, and, and first, we really received a lot of input from the development design communities and developing those ordinances. We met on multiple occasions with um, developers and also on a couple of occasions with uh, representatives from the Water Collaborative Greater New Orleans, both the builders and designers group, um, who are mostly made up of engineers and landscape architects working in the field. Um, as well as contractors who are building these facilities for people. Um, and so what the process really looks like is removing the existing stormwater requirements from this, the comprehensive zoning ordinance. So essentially making Article 23 of the ordinance just a landscape chapter and removing the stormwater specific requirements um, to move those compliance standards into the building code and establish um, what we're going to be calling the stormwater code of the city of New Orleans within that code. And then establishing a stormwater plan review division within safety and permits to review and inspect plans and projects, which is already to the council's adoption of the budget would create which create those positions. So just to give you an overview of the sort of five main components of the new code, I'm going to start going into these in detail. So the first being um, construction requirements. So this really gets to what you were just talking about with, with Danny and Cynthia, is that um, during the construction phase, there's often a lot of construction waste, there's a lot of sediment that runs off the construction site that ends up in our cash basis. And it's really become one of the, the largest challenges in maintaining our stormwater infrastructure. Um, so at present, you know, we have a, a sort of um, distributed uh, myriad a number of regulations, both in the sanitation code, uh, sewer and water works plumbing code. There are some specific codes um, that require certain things um, with regards to the construction site and water management, uh, but we have no real dedicated place where we have a, a, a concise set of regulations um, for stormwater management with regards to construction sites. And, the result of that is, is that the photo on the right of the slide is actually a construction site in District D, um, in District D, excuse me, um, that where the, the proper erosion control was not provided, no, no uh, um, catch basin clean, uh, protection was provided. And so this catch basin completely filled with sediment from that construction site over a matter of a few months. Um, I was on site while um, a DPW crew cleaned this catch basin. This was one of the ones that took them about two to three hours to clean because of the amount of compacted clay um, that had run off of that construction site. What site is this? Uh, this is the Bastion site, um, just off the one down right now. Yeah, I'm here. Um, and so what we're going to be requiring in the sort of first portion of the stormwater code is a number of new construction requirements, which would require silt fencing and catch basin protection at all sites, at all construction sites, um, and the provision of concrete washout facilities for all construction sites where concrete is required. Um, and so, uh, at present, we have no real requirements for concrete washout. I think the plumbing code for the sewer and water board says you can't discharge concrete into catch basins um, because of the, the effects on the water quality. And so what we'd like to do is just say, if you're going to be transporting concrete to a site, um, here are some standards you have to meet, which are you have to provide a concrete washout facility that meets these standards. So it has to be a certain size, it has to contain the concrete in a certain way. There's a number of very inexpensive ways you can do that by just taking a hole and putting and washing the concrete out into the hole and then breaking up the concrete later and moving it from the site or burying it, um, all the way up to facilities you can purchase um, that you actually set up on site. Would that include every driveway you pour? So most of the times, my understanding is for the very small concrete jobs that they can actually, they have time to transport the truck back to the facility to wash it out before the concrete would set within the chute in the truck. And so for this, the ordinance allows you, if you are not able to provide a washout facility on site, that you have to transport it back to the washout facility at the facility to do the washout. But under no circumstances are you to wash it out in the, in the public right of way, um, or just on the, the side of the road, or into a catch basin, which we frequently see at this time. So when it comes to the post-construction requirements, this is really the sort of compliance standards that are currently contained within Article 23 that will be moving over into the building code. Um, there are no substantial changes to this. We are making some tweaks to it. Um, within the thresholds, we're not changing the square footage. I know um, there were a lot of debates when the CZ was being um, drafted around, you know, whether it's 5,000 square feet, whether it's 10,000 square feet, whether it's 2,000 square feet. Um, we landed at 5,000 square feet in 2015. We're going to keep it at 5,000 square feet now. We think that's the right threshold for the city at this time. 
Um, but what we wanted to do was just add a few extra pieces so that some of those projects that fall through the cracks now, we went through um, finding loopholes and, and using permeable paving materials for, for that last 100 square feet to get the minimum threshold, um, or by doing multiple building permits over time so that they're not adding um, all 5,000 square feet at once, but maybe over the course of a year or two. And so the new thresholds look like uh, if you're building a building or a site with 5,000 square feet of impervious, you're substantially improving a site with 5,000 square feet of impervious. Those are as it is now. A site, uh, any site over an acre, which is in the ordinance now. And then we're adding any site where the principal use is stormwater management. So we just want to make sure if uh, a community group or the city itself wants to take a, a lot or a, a property and turn it over for a stormwater management facility, that at the very least it meets the stringent standards of the stormwater code, that we're not just allowing projects who claim uh, to manage stormwater um, as the principal use to, to go by uh, lesser standards. We wanted to at least meet the standards of the stormwater code. Um, and then this new, uh, which is really meant to close those new poles, is that any addition or replacement of the impervious surface, which results in 5,000 or more uh, square feet of the impervious surface. So um, at present, it's sort of unclear. For instance, if you have a building 4,500 square feet um, and you add uh, 3,000 square feet to it, or even another 4,500 square feet, if that project would have to comply or not. Um, I think that at present we've been saying that it should, but the law does not necessarily read that explicitly. And so what we'd like to say is that if, if you're resulting in over 5,000 square feet of impervious, then you do have to comply with the code. Um, we're going to remit keep the exemptions for single and two-family structures and actually pumping up the um, exemption up to residential facilities with like six units, um, because that's the, the sort of typical exemptions for providing the code for other, other sort of residential scale things. And then we're also adding some exemptions for pay pavement maintenance and tenant build-outs. At present, there's no real guidance on, um, say, if I'm just going to uh, resurface a parking lot. The code uh, at present doesn't really distinguish whether that is um, new and pervious service or not. Um, depending on your opinion, you could kind of consider it to be either way. And so what we're saying is, is if, if you're just replacing the top layer of pavement, you're not disturbing the, the sub-base of that pavement at all, then we're not going to require you to go through the process. You can go ahead and replace the asphalt and have on top, and, and we'll allow you to do that. Um, and if you're just uh, building out a tenant space, so if, if you've got a strip mall and you've got a tenant space in there and you're just opening up a new a new facility in that space, a new cafe or a new uh, at t store or something like that, um, and, and that space is over 5,000 square feet, we're not going to require you to do stormwater management on site for just building out the interior. But, but you would, if you, let's suppose a whole space is blighted and you're redoing the whole space. Yeah. Would that trigger the uh, requirement? Yeah, so if, if it falls within the um, the determination of a substantial improvement, then they would be required to go through the process of the stormwater. Yeah, which is that, the way the ordinance works currently. Um, so we are uh, revising the comp compliance standards only slightly. At present, um, we do still require the detention uh, or retention and filtration of the first inch and a quarter of stormwater. So that's that's remaining the same again. That that number was debated extensively before 2015. We think it's the right number for now, and, and we'd like to continue with that number. Um, what we are going to do is going to allow um, the entitlement of a 10% bypass. And so it's, to explain that, essentially, if you have a, a site, particularly in New Orleans, this is important because of our elevation requirements. Um, if you have a building that, say, is set back three feet from the front property line, that building is also probably going to be raised three feet off the ground. You're going to have some landscape that's going to be graded up to meet that building. And so that area is going to have runoff on it that's going to be very difficult to capture and route back to, say, five square feet might be on the rear of the property. And so as long as that area doesn't exceed 10% of the total site area, we're going to allow you to just let that run over the sidewalk and the street. That's fine. As long as you provide the, the equivalent volume within the detention facility. Will, um, will these changes uh, speed up the process? I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Process? Yeah, I'm excited to, to tell you about that in just a minute. Because we, of course, we get a lot of complaints in our right. office yep. from residents and businesses that are trying to finalize and get their permits to start building. Yeah, absolutely. I get, I get the complaints as well in my office, so I'm happy to, uh, happy to also get those off my desk. So I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we are going to continue to require no increase in runoff rate for a 10 or 24 hour storm. Um, that's the current standard and it's the standard that's pretty much um, universal within the region. Um, and then we are going to be uh, including a new water quality standard and this is really driven by our permit requirements under the Clean Water Act. 
um, that you do have a reduction in total suspended solids of 60% for new developments and 40% for substantial improvements. At present, the vast majority of uh, plans that have been approved meet that standard. Um, we're just actually enshrining it in the law so that it, it is a requirement. Because at present, the water quality standard just says you have to filter. It doesn't give you an actual standard to meet. Um, so almost all um, best management practices that are proposed meet the 60% TSS removal standard. So to, to get to your question, Council Member Blake said, um, at present on the left, you have a flow chart the way the process works at present. So at, right now, if I'm a developer, I, I come in, I apply for my permit, and the permit analysis says, oh, well, this is over 5,000 square feet. You have to go over to city planning. So I go over to city planning, city planning says, I have to turn this application, I have to prepare this plan, submit it to them. They send it out after they determine that it's complete to five different agencies. They review it. They send me a plan review letter. I go back and forth with them for a while. They finally approve my plan. I have to record a bond or record the plans, post a bond, and then I can go back over to the permits for, for processing. So that right now takes an average of 139 days. Then I get over to plan review, where my plans are reviewed again, um, and then my permits final issues. At, at present, that takes about 33 days. And so what we're proposing to do is cut out that 139 days and build the stormwater project, uh, stormwater plan review into that 33-day review from safety and permits. So if you look at the flow chart on the right, it's much more simplified where you're coming in with your um, application, you're just submitting your stormwater management plan with your typical permit set of drawings that you would on any other project. Um, the permit analyst will make sure it's complete. It'll go to plan review where we'll have stormwater plan reviewers who are qualified to review those plans themselves so that it doesn't have to out to the fiber mechanical, electrical, foundation, and all of the all the stuff that goes in the, the existing plan review letter, and it, it's all handled by the plan review division as all of their comments are at present. Once you've resolved those comments, um, your permit will be issued. The inspectors, who are the same people as the plan reviewers, will be inspecting the process throughout to make sure that everything's being built properly. And then at the end, um, the designer will prepare an as built drawing. Uh, what we found is that with a lot of these stormwater facilities, um, a lot of changes have to be made in the field based on different field conditions, whether it be utilities, uh, or things located at uh, different elevations, the way the site has to be graded based on maybe the survey being wrong. And so what, at present, the way the regulations are written, you have to record the drawings before the project is even gone out to permit, means that when changes have to be made in the field, those changes then have to be retroactively approved. What this will do is, is they'll give us a, an as-built drawing at the end, and as long as that as-built drawing is compliant with the standards and the project is compliant, and that's the plan that's going to be considered the approved final plan. And that's the one that they'll record. They'll also, at that time, post the 25% performance on the maintenance. And so that means that the project won't be held up in the beginning stages by having to do that. It'll be at the very end. And then, at that point, the best management practices, the stormwater facilities they build, will be considered to be certified for the year. Um, and that means that they are, are able to open the facility, receive their certificate of occupancy, and they'll be good to go. I think you should take this information uh, and provide for a guide or graphic or a handout and post it to the website so businesses can be informed about this reform process uh, because we need to simplify it as best we can, as much as we can, so people can uh, invest in our city and not be uh, you know, uh, distracted or, or, or turned away from um, a, a process that's bought down in, in red tape. The permit analysts, so they just check for the completeness of the application. So that's that turnaround time should be. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, they come and make the application and then. So the application. Yeah, right before plan review. That process is, is the initial intake. Is the, you're coming to apply, what are you applying for? Do you have your necessary documents? Let's give you, a, at the point of question, a couple answers. If you know that you're missing something that's glaring, uh, just in terms of, you know, from macro level. So, hey, you're gonna need a contract with a contractor. Hey, you're gonna need architectural plans for this. Hey, you're gonna need to go see the state farm. The individual review comments are gonna come later once it's actually been evaluated. You know, but there, there are many times where right now you have a applicant that comes in and is told, hey, you are going to need to go to a whole different agency to do a review uh, that then bounces the applicant across the hall, then has to go deal with that whole process, and then has to return back to safety <coughs> permits. What we're doing here is kind of is, is simplifying that for the applicant to where they sit down with one person 
and they're making them all, they're making one application for one project, and that one application is going to then trigger another review. Imagine it as if it was a project that needed an electrical review due to the installation of new service. You know, that project is going to then be triggered to go see the electrical reviewer, and later in the field is going to need an electrical inspector. We're going to determine that in-house, and of course those comments are going to be as per development as per project. Uh, but rather than you be punted to a whole different agency to then start a whole new process with them and then return to us later, you're going to do that all in-house in a much more streamlined fashion. And what about the plan review? How long roughly does that? The, the 30, I mean, I, I, you're saying 33 days, but... The 33 days up there is an honest question, as an honest answer related to our average. That 33 days is actually much higher than what it takes to review a plan right now. We do anticipate with a plan with uh, stormwater for an increase, uh, but with that 33 days does not factor in, let's say we do a review in five business days and we send comments back out to the architect to, to respond to, we do not have a way to take out that time. So our 33 days includes the time that the public then processes that information and comes up with a response. But uh, we, I'll be very honest, I expect it to be right around that 33 days for the stormwater to actually get responses back, to get comments back. Uh, we are going to be eliminating agencies from this. We're going to be eliminating people from this, which we fully expect to decrease the time uh, and the moving parts, and therefore some frustrations with the public, which we're all aware of. Because, yeah, frustrations and the process being cumbersome uh, and intimidating, being a person coming off the street trying to get their project on the way. Uh, so the city has to do its part at, at every level. I mean, it's paramount to make sure that people get in and uh, get turned around quickly. Absolutely. And, and I'm just going to second that. I guess there are two levels. First of all, there's the, the small guy who's doing just a few jobs, or maybe someone doing his own job. Uh, he just gets frustrated. He can't go anywhere. He's going to have to do the job because it's his house or his building here in the city. But then there's a bigger developer who looks around and says, where is the easiest place to do business? And we need to be the easiest place to do business, or at least we need to be in the ballpark. Let me ask you, the 33 days, uh, how does that compare with other places do we know? I do not have a stat on that right now, but I will tell you from anecdotal uh, responses from developers around, our plan review and safety and permits is faster than any of the major uh, developed areas in the South. That's Houston, Atlanta, Miami, uh, and whatnot. So our uh, plan review division currently, I believe, exceeds that of other jurisdictions. Uh, the stormwater part uh, as a whole development is absolutely weighing our whole development time down. And again, the whole point of this simplification process is to simplify that and to expedite. Well, well, that's great. In all honesty, the complaints I hear are, are generally tied around some water management. So that's what we hear as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, I want to thank you both for those comments as well. We, we agree that we need to do something. And, um, you know, in terms of the outreach to the community, I think what's really important is getting getting this adopted so that way we can start to develop materials and, and do more outreach to the community. We've done some targeted outreach just to make sure that um, the community is supportive of, of this and that, that they find it workable. And from the feedback that we've received so far, um, the design community is very supportive of it that, that I've seen. Um, and the developers that I've met with have found this to be a much more palatable um, program than the existing um, way the program works. The next thing to talk about is fee and loop. So under the Article 23 requirements, um, there is a clause within there that contemplates the creation of a program for fee and compliance. That program, though, was never really set up in the law. It just sort of contemplated its possible existence at one point in time. And so in, over the last two years, co conversations have been had between myself and city planning, safety and permits, law, on how we could potentially set up this program. And there was always the it was always known that there would be some kind of legal mechanism needed on the part of the, the council, not just to set the itself, but also to set up the program. And so it seems like a, a perfect time when we're, we're sort of transforming the program 
switching where it's located and how it works to also institute the fee the program to create that relief valve on the system. Every other city that has a stringent um, detention and filtration program has some, some sort of relief valve that's not a variance, um, and typically that's a fee removal. And so this is really intended to apply to sites where compliance is truly impractical. Um, and the determination ultimately, in, it, it's laid out in the ordinance at this time, would be made by the director of the Department of Safety and Permits according to the possible approval. And the topography, soil, vegetation, drainage, spatial limitations, unusually shaped pieces of land, unusual servitude requirements or superseding regulatory requirements are such that full compliance is impractical. And so what that means is that we're going to try to require as much compliance as possible. So if you can do half, We'd like to see you do half, and then you can pay the fee for the other half. Um, if you can't do any, then you can pay the fee for the whole thing, as long as you can demonstrate that to us. But you do have to provide documentation that you attempted to design a compliant plan, calculations of what, what the required storage volume would be so that we can calculate that fee, the cost estimates of possible solutions. And so the proposed rate that we're looking at is $44 per cubic foot of required storage. Um, this is based on cost data collected from the past two years of, of compliant plans with the city. Um, it was analyzed by Reptelis Financial Consultants, which is the leading sort of finance agency with regards to water issues in the country. They have developed the new programs for utilities across the country. Um, and we provided you, I believe, in the fall of a memo uh, with their memo explaining their analysis and also a memo sort of giving you an idea of, of what effect this would have on the existing plans. The analysis that I've done shows that about 20% of projects would likely pay the fee, and that's just simply based on cost. So if, if, a, if you look at all the projects we've had in the last two years of the program, about 20% of projects, their cost was over $45 per cubic foot, and so those projects are likely to apply for the fee in lieu. There may be some projects that the cost data is lower than the fee, and they may try to apply, but we may say, it looks like you can do this for cheaper than paying the fee, so you might want to try it. Um, so that's really, Sort of the, the way that the fee and works is, is it's sort of driven by cost. From an engineering point of view, anything's possible. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're if the only way to comply is by building a million dollar detention facility, that's not really gonna work for anybody. And we don't really have any interest in making someone build a million dollar detention facility and they could potentially pay pay a hundred thousand dollar fee. Um, so that's really what it comes down to. In in addition to the fee, there's an, a, a third ordinance that you're looking at which would establish the Integrated Green Infrastructure Project Fund. So this is where the actual fund, funds from the fee, the revenue from the fee, would go to. Uh, so this is being considered concurrent to the stormwater code regulation and directs the Department of Public Works to utilize the funds to design, construct, and maintain public green stormwater infrastructure projects, which result in a minimum per cubic foot storage equivalent to the revenue received from the payments in lieu compliance on an annualized basis. So that means that they need to be building, so if you have a project that's supposed to contain 1,000 cubic feet of stormwater, they pay $44,000 for their fee in lieu because it's $44 a cubic foot. Department of Public Works has to provide at least 1,000 cubic feet of storage in order for them to, to spend the funds on that. What would, what would be the cost, uh, average cost of a project uh, if, the, uh, if they did a fee in lieu? Well, it's a, it's so the the fee is based on the required detention volume, which is based on the size of the site. So it, it, a, an average is difficult to give you. Um, but for instance, you know, I was talking, we were talking to a developer about this recently who had, had tried to go through the variance process and had a, a difficult time compl complying a site, probably would have been a good candidate for fee in lieu. And I believe his storage volume was like 1,300 cubic feet. Um, so at that rate, we're talking about, you know, a, about $50,000. Um, which really is, is actually quite low because I think he ended up spending for about a half compliance of it because he granted a partial waiver. I think he ended up spending you know, close to $70,000 on the project. So it would have actually saved him money to go through the fee and route. And it, uh, just really quickly, the, the advantage is too that because of our efficiency in terms of being able to build larger facilities than, our, than private developers can, often we, can, we will be able to achieve orders of magnitude of, of two or three times the volume on our projects. Um, that's been sort of what's been found across the country with, with other FEMA projects is that um, in some communities they actually prefer the FEMA approach over the compliance approach because they are more efficient with the funds and can actually build larger amounts of storage than developers can. So if you receive funds for 3,000 cubic, cubic feet of water, they're able to build six, 8,000 cubic feet of storage with that money. Can you explain what are green infrastructure projects? 
So green stormwater infrastructure is, is defined within the ordinance. Um, so I'm going to pull up that definition. Where would these projects be built? Um, well, so we need to add that. It looks like we got removed from this draft to the ordinance. So we'll be adding that back in for sure. Um, but green infrastructure projects are really defined as, as any stormwater project which mimics a natural function. So it's a, a bioretention facility. Um, a bioswale, permeable pavement, things that slow down the water and act as if um, the area were undeveloped. Um, in terms of where the projects will be located, um, I think we'll be asking the Department of Public Works to report back to the council annually on where they're looking to build those projects. It'll be part of the capital improvements plan. Um, our advice that we've received from Raptelis in, in terms of, because you know there needs to be a logical nexus between the collection of funds and spending of those funds. In most cities, they require that you spend those funds within the same watershed. New Orleans is very unique in that we don't have watersheds. We have a single watershed that's mechanized. Um, so really, in terms of the legal perspective, we can spend those money, those money anywhere. And we believe from an equity point of view, we want to be spending that money all over the city, rather than in the actual drainage area in which it was collected, because the vast majority of these projects are in the courthouse district and CBD. And so what we don't want to do is build a ton of green infrastructure on the high ground in one area of the city that's probably the richest part of the city. Um, what we want to be doing is spreading those funds all over the city and use it in places where it's needed the most. Right, it right. should be spent everywhere. And so you're saying that the department, the right of public works, will be making the decision of where they go? Yeah, so it'll, it'll become part of the capital improvements program. It'll be part of the budget. Uh, so the council will have oversight of those funds in that way. Um, but the, the actual ordinance establishing the fund requires an annual reporting requirement where the funds are spent so that you can also audit that at the end. Let me ask a question. Uh, can you just acquire a storage area? I mean, suppose, for example, there's already an area that's capable of storing the water. Uh, and, I, and when I ask, can you require it? Because I have a second question. I'm wondering if, uh, say, a, a neighborhood that has a lake that would be a storage area, uh, is there some way that a neighborhood can lease space to you or lease storage capacity to you? Right. So, so essentially what you're alluding to is creating sort of like a, a, tra a credit trading system. Um, and that system has been um, attempted in Washington, D.C. They're the, the first city in the country to sort of attempt to do a stormwater credit trading system. Um, they are, I think, in the third year of doing that. They've only had a few projects that have been able to do it. Um, it has been useful, though, for instance, there have been some churches where the utility has been able to give those churches grants to build the facility, and then the developers pay the church to lease the storage that's on that facility. So it's been very useful there, but I think it's something that, as a, as a, as a city of New Orleans, I don't think that we're, I, we're, we're still in the beginning stages. Um, case in point that we're two years into this program and looking to completely reshape it because it's not working. Um, I'm not sure that we're at the point where we have the capacity to contemplate such a complex system in which we're trading credits and checking up on those credits and making sure that everything works. But I think it's something that I'm keeping in mind as we continue the program and that is, is valuable to keep in mind over time as, as the, the program matures. Um, and so next I'd like to talk about the annual certification requirement. This is going to be a new new requirement from the ordinance. And at, as the way it works now, essentially you you are sort of turned away at when you get your, your certificate of occupancy as saying, you know, you have to sign this agreement that says you're going to maintain the stormwater BMP in perpetuity. Uh, we have a two-year bond that you posted for the maintenance. But um, aside from, you know, incidental inspections that we might happen to do on an occasional basis or um, folks reporting complaints that, for, for instance, maybe a detention facility is holding water for a month or more. Um, there's not really a, a great feedback loop for ensuring that these facilities are being maintained properly. And so um, we were also looking at, in, in sort of amending this code at ways that we could better close the loop on the end of a project to make sure that the, the maintenance is actually happening in the right way. And so we actually are looking to our neighbors to the, to the west in the city of Houston. They use a, a system called a certification uh, where Essentially, when you receive your certificate of occupancy, uh, they do the same where they require the um, posting or the recording of an asphalt plan um, before you receive your certificate of occupancy. 
and then your facility is considered certified. With it, at 11 months, you receive a letter in the mail from the city that says it's time to recertify your PMPs. And so the owner can call up any civil engineer or landscape architect license in the state. It doesn't have to be the one that, that um, designed it. Um, and they come out, they take some photos, they make sure that it, it actually still matches the asphalt plan that it's continued to be maintained as it was built. They send that inspection report to the city along with the $250 check to, to um, recertify the facility and they get a recertification for another year. And so what this allows us to do is cut down on the amount of uh, inspectors that the city needs to have in terms of providing resources on our end to go out and actually look at all these facilities on an annual basis. Because especially once we get to the point where we have thousands of these, it's unrealistic for us to be in the field checking on these all the time. And it also creates an environment where the owners are actually aware that the facilities are there and that they do have a responsibility to maintain them. What we found is that a lot of times what happens is a developer will build the facilities, but then they lease the facility to someone else, or they immediately sell the facility, or it changes hands in some other way to financing mechanisms. And the person who's actually operating the facility really has no idea that, 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 there's, a, that, that there's a stormwater facility there that requires regular maintenance. And so they don't know that there's permeable pavement in the parking lot that has to be vacuumed on an annual basis. They don't know that there's a biosoil that has to be weeded and mulched on an annual basis. And so if we create this feedback loop between the city and the operator, it, it creates an environment where they know, oh,